Support from True Leaf Market is helping to keep on the ledge thriving and growing. True Leaf Market are the indoor and outdoor growing experts, chosen by more than half a million customers for their seed and gardening needs. True Leaf Market offers a great range of plant seeds, from houseplants like the polka dot plant and the asparagus fern, to vegetables and flowers to grow in the garden. And when it comes to kits for growing microgreens, wheatgrass and sprouting seeds, True Leaf Market's range of starter kits will provide everything you need to get started. And all their products come with a 30-day satisfaction guarantee, so I know you won't be disappointed. US listeners, you can get 10% off your first purchase at trueleafmarket.com now using the offer code on the ledge. So go to trueleafmarket.com and enter the offer code on the ledge for 10% off. True Leaf Market, bringing the seed you need. Welcome to On The Ledge podcast. I'm your host, Jane Perone, bringing you the A to Z of houseplants and how to care for them. Where A is that alocasia that's going downhill fast and Z is that double Z plant which just doesn't die. This week's show features part two of the interview with the carnivorous plant guru that is Peter D'Amato, author of The Savage Garden and owner and founder of California Carnivores. I'll also be answering a question about an umbrella plant with hydrophobic soil. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started with the second part of my Peter D'Amato interview. And I wanted to tell you that the Cynical Gardener, also known as lovely listener June, has come back with more information about hardy chlorophytums. This one comes from the Cotswold Garden Flowers Nursery here in the UK, owned by the legendary nurseryman Bob Brown. And it's called Chlorophytum crookianum. That's crookianum with a K, or in fact two Ks. And this one is a hardy chlorophytum with white flowers on a very tall, stiff head over a very long period of July to November. It's two to three metres tall. That sounds very intriguing. Has anyone grown it? I'd love to hear. I know, spider plant episode. It will be coming if I can find the right interviewees. No one's getting back to me. Come on, spider plant people. Talk to me. And a shout out to all my listeners in Australia. I seem to have had a little flush of reviews on Apple Podcasts from you guys uh, down under. Do you mind being called down under? I've no idea if that's offensive these days. But anyway, Jane Firth Perth, that's hard to say, says she just found the podcast and she loves it and it's making her chuckle, which is great. And Andy's Boys, also in Australia, says so informative and easy to listen to. There is no fluff, just plant talk from some really experienced growers slash enthusiasts slash experts thank you very much andy's boys and finally vonnie one two three four says that she she or he has been binge listening and has caught up more or less in about two weeks that's impressive listening that's a lot that's a lot of hours of listening to me drone on and they've learned so much they're a succulent lover and collector but this show has opened my eyes to a whole new range of plants well it's great to have you guys on board and i love hearing from listeners all around the world so if you're in a country that i haven't mentioned do get in touch and i will give you a shout out on the show and remember i still would love to hear from you about what on the ledge podcast means for you for the 100th episode so get your smartphone out find the voice app and just record yourself rambling away for a minute or so it doesn't have to be anything fancy you don't have to declare undying love you just have to say that you like on the ledge and you think it's great (laughs) that's pretty much all that's required if you want to say you hate it that's fine too and just email that into me at on the ledge podcast at gmail.com i want to hear your voices in that hundredth episode so please do contribute if you can and if you are really shy you can always just email me some written words about the show too 
Welcome to new patrons Stephanie, Daniel and Leanne this week, all helping to keep On The Ledge afloat with your very kind donations. To find out how to donate, please visit my show notes at janeperone.com where you'll also find loads of useful information for this week's show. Right, that's not the housekeeping on the head. That wasn't too painful, was it? And it's time to get on to our chat with Peter D'Amato. If you haven't got around to listening to the previous episode, number 93, then I would stop now and go back and listen to that for the first part of the interview, because it probably won't make a lot of sense, episode 94, unless you go back and listen to the first half of the interview. But assuming you've done that, let's get on and hear from Peter. And we cover lots of ground in this section, answering listener questions and finding out more about Peter's life with carnivorous plants. And... I start off by asking him a question about potting mixes. Let's have a word about the potting mix for these plants, which again is substantially different than regular houseplant compost might be. Here in the UK, there's a lot of concern about use of peat in potting mixes because our peat uh, sources are limited. I, I I understand that's not so much of a big issue in the US or not so much of an issue that environmentalists are concerned about is peat really the only thing that you can grow carnivorous plants in or are there some alternatives now there's very very few alternatives um i still find that sphagnum peat moss without fertilizers added because here in the states some of the brands are adding fertilizers to the canadian sphagnum peat that is sold in big bales for for outdoor gardens Uh, But if you get pure sphagnum peat moss for many of the carnivorous plants, that's still the number one uh, soil requirement for things like Venus flytraps, American pitcher plants, most of the sundews. Plants like Nepenthes, uh, the majority of their soil should be long-fibered sphagnum moss, such as New Zealand sphagnum moss. This is what peat moss comes from but it's the long strands of the moss that are used. Here in the United States, we are much more fortunate because almost all of Canada are peat bogs. And I've read reports where, you know, there's some people that are concerned about harvesting peat from Canada. It's such a tiny amount of land that is generally used for harvesting that I'm personally not that worried about it. Um, But it's still Canadian sphagnum peat moss that is the best. I have had very, very bad luck with coconut fibers. Um, There's some carnivorous plants that might be able to tolerate um, coconut, like ground up coconut coconut shells. Uh, It forms a peat-like mix, but in my experience, they're often too salty even after they're heavily washed. And also, they decompose too rapidly. Sphagnum peat moss can last for years, and that's still my strong recommendation for use. Okay, and I've got a question from Annie about her nepenthes, and I think this this is normally it's it's the question is why is my nepenthes dying? But Annie has a problem in that her nepenthes, which is she sent me a picture, and it's in a window sill, and the trouble is that it's actually kind of it's bursting out of the windowsill it's so big it's about i'd say it looks about three foot tall and she wants to know whether she uh, whether she can just hack it back or is is there any way of keeping it under control are these plants things that you can just kind of you know during the growing season give them a good pruning or are they a bit yes yes now nepenthes are a magnificent genus because the plants Um, They send out ground rosettes, uh, lower leaves with pitchers that sit on the ground. Then they begin their climbing vine, and that's what can get out of control. The vines in some of the species can grow for yards, literally, um, and they climb usually into shrubs or trees. And the hanging upper pitchers often look very different than the lower pitchers. However, virtually, once you have a mature rosette with a climbing vine, new shoots develop at the base of the plant at soil level 
virtually every year. So the vine continues to grow. It will even flower. That's where the flowers come from, or the upper vines. While you start to get bushy shoots down at the bottom, I would leave the shoots alone to regrow the plant, but you could cut the vine back. Woody parts of the vine, like if it's several years old, the older parts of the vine, you'll have pruned off dead leaves. It looks rather woody. It isn't any good for propagation. But the green parts can be cut into sections, and you can then root those. Um, You would have to, you know, I would refer to books on carnivorous plants like my own or go to the International Society and look up propagating nepenthes, which will explain uh, how easy it is to propagate nepenthes from the cuttings. But And then you could give the cuttings away to all of your little friends, you know. <laughs> um, but definitely uh, prune nepenthes periodically when they just get too big to handle. Do you like to just, when you've got a moment of spare time, go into your nursery and just stare at all these incredible i mean I'm, i can't imagine how you get any work done because i would just be in there just going oh my gosh this two foot picture's just caught a rat this is incredible i'm not sure i'd get any work done at all and customers asking you questions as well i'm sure it's it's a must be a wonderful environment to to, to have developed and worked in over the past few decades it is absolutely wonderful Um, However, we are open to the public five days a week, and we're a very, very popular tourist attraction uh, here in the wine country. Um, But also, we have a tremendous mail order business, which also keeps us busy. Uh, We have about eight or nine employees now, and uh, running the nursery is extremely uh, labor-intensive. It can be rather overwhelming at times especially when it comes to propagating new plants for sale. But yes, every now and then when we close our doors, um, there, it's just absolute heaven to just wander around and look at the plants. And our nursery and our collection has gotten so large, and my business partner, Damon, pretty much handles all the propagation and obtaining new plants and uh, working with uh, uh, a fellow, Mike, who runs our tissue culture lab, that I don't even know what we're growing anymore. Damon will, uh, almost every day when I go there, he goes, did you see this new pinguicula flower from the hybrid that I made? Um, Or I'll wander around and I'll say, where did this helium flora come from? Um, It's just a magnificent experience to just look around and and mellow out with the plants you know it really is and I, i'm sure this is the case that you get the occasionally th- 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 i guess maybe no questions are stupid questions but you must get some great questions from people coming in uh who are not necessarily are coming on a tourist trip and, and they're not necessarily carnivorous plant fans do people say things like it has it ever eaten a person like do you get any cra- really crazy questions is what i want to know <laughs> we get you know kids who want to know if we have teacher eating plants and you know where's audrey <laughs> we, we do have an old uh, stage puppet from little shop of horror so they want to see audrey i really wish we had a big trithid you know <laughs> um but yeah there, there are questions like that another thing is that many people um are under the assumption that these plants will eat uh plant pests like aphids or mealybug in the garden, um, and that is not true. Uh, unfortunately, carnivorous plants do get attacked by very uh, similar pests that attack regular house plants and garden plants. And there's a lot of natural insecticides that help take care of that, like pyrethrins with canola oil. But that's something that a lot of people come in, you know, wondering about. If they want a plant for a patio to eat flies and yellow jackets, yes, we recommend uh, uh, the trumpet plants, the American pitcher plants, Saracenia. Uh, They can really do quite a number on outdoor flies and stuff. Um, But it's, yeah, it's often questions I bet you've I bet you've heard it all. I mean, did you tell anyone about the rat? You know, you sort of said, yeah, this is this is the pitcher plant that's eaten a rat recently. Does that is that a selling point? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we have not. Um, we don't want to, you know, freak people out. 
Um, there's some, you know, of our regular customers who come in or collectors that we have mentioned it. Um, Nepenthes, like most of the pitcher plants, they produce antiseptics, apparently. So there isn't even any bad smell coming from this pitcher. And when the pitcher starts to turn brown, you know, we're probably going to cut it off and we'll take it outside and cut it open and see what it looks like. But Jane, I I wander around the nursery rescuing things. Uh, We have Pacific chorus frogs all over the place. And uh, if I see a, a frog trapped in a cobra plant, for instance, I can't sleep at night, you know. I'll cut the pitcher open and release the frog. And sometimes, you know, even things like uh, like yellow jackets, uh, wasps, if, if they fall into a saracenia outdoors, and if that pitcher plant is filled with ants, um, I mentioned in my book, it's, it's like, imagine a human person falling down a greased well filled with oh rats. Oh, my gosh. A uh, horrible death. And I'll tip the pitcher open and shake it until uh, the yellow jacket can fly away, even if it has a lot of ants, you know, biting it. <laughs> but in my old age, I've gotten quite uh, sensitive, and, and I don't like to see things, you know, suffer and be tortured. Well, I can understand that. I, ha- I do remember, you know, hearing blue bottles and things trapped in Saracenia pictures, and it is... If you're sitting there listening to to it kind of buzzing around trying to get out, it is, yeah, it is a bit unnerving sometimes. I can appreciate that. Yeah, it's like that old movie, The Fly. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, the Vincent Price movie where the guy with the f- the fly head yeah. <laughs> and then the fly with the human head gets caught in the spider it's web. It's the horrible <laughs> fascination, I suppose, that is also part of the, the, the carnivorous plant's appeal. I mean, I know that there are passionate passionate collectors in every corner of the horticultural world that the orchid collectors are very passionate the cactus collectors but it does seem to me that possibly carnivorous plant addicts are among the most passionate about their subject and i'm sure you get do get sort of people who are completists who want to have every species of whichever genus they're specializing in and won't rest until they've they found them. What, what do you think? It is that sort of the fascination of the, the way, the incredible way that they have evolved that is is the big draw to carnivorous plants. Well, initially, Jane. Initially, people often are fascinated because these plants don't just sit there, because they do catch and eat things. But after a while, it's really the incredible beauty of the plants that people are mesmerized by. And in fact, there are a lot of growers that prefer to feed their plants with uh, different foliar fertilizers or fertilizer pellets in the pitchers because they don't want to ruin the beauty of like a sundew by having all of these insects caught on them. Um, And uh, that's generally been my experience with our uh, customers. It's the awesome, incredible looks of the plants that really get them and not simply the fact that these things are eating things. Well, that's that. I guess that's good to know that it's not it's not all to do with the, the, the horror or the goriness of it, uh, which brings us neatly round to a particularly attractive picture plant, which a listener called um, Cynthia wanted to know about. Uh, it's Nepenthes edwardsiana, which um, was not familiar to me, but when I googled it, it it just looks an in, like an incredible, um, has an incredible toothed kind of uh, rim to this very scarlet picture. Yes, the peristopes, the lips of the of pictures like Nepenthes edwardsiana, and there are a few others like Velosa and Nepenthes hamata that uh, have these hooks around the mouth. And generally, they're very, very slippery and covered with nectar, and they enhance insects like ants falling into the pitchers. But some of them, like Nepenthes edwardsiana, can be a bit challenging because they are very high-altitude plants from, like, the mountains of Borneo. They'll grow, you know, 6,000 feet elevation where the temperatures are usually rather chilly day and night. 
Um, so they can be rather challenging. And they're also often very rare in cultivation. To get these plants mass produced, you have to get seed of the plant and you have to have male and female nepenthes to produce the seed unless somebody mm-hmm. gets a permit and is you know able to collect some seed from the wild which does not happen very very often uh, but yes uh, some of these pitcher plants are quite extraordinary in how they look uh, with their teeth and they can look very very uh, yeah i guess this is where all the the myths about you know human eating pitchers comes from <laughs> this idea that they they look very deadly well when they start walking you know when they start walking <laughs> i'm getting out of the business and myself <laughs> we'll be hearing more from peter after the break but now let's hear from the other sponsor for this week's show on the lens is supported by growth technology the nutrient company that helps your house plants thrive finding the right fertilizers for your plants can be confusing but growth technology's focus range of plant specific feeds make it really easy to care for everything from bonsai to banana plants and they contain all the essential nutrients for healthy vigorous growth including calcium and magnesium and they're enriched with seaweed and humic acid to support long-term soil fertility Visit Growth Technologies' website, focus-on-plants.com, for loads of great houseplant advice on everything from keeping your orchids happy to taking care of palms. You'll find Growth Technologies' products available online and in many good garden centres and nurseries across the UK. So choose Growth Technology for healthy, happy houseplants. And now in the final part of our interview with Peter D'Amato, we're answering questions about Nepenthes and we'll be finding out how Peter is taking his love of carnivorous plants to a completely new level with a rather creative project. Another question from Cynthia. She's got a lot of questions about Nepenthes. She says she's got a Ventrata that's putting out a basal shoot, but soon after all the pictures dried and she's not sure because of the lower light levels or because it's putting energy into the shoot. She wants to know about the biology of the basal shoot. Is it happy and reproducing, or is it sad and sending out some last hope? A lot of times when they have a climbing vine, and if you get a basal shoot, sometimes the climbing vine slows down its growth. It may also flower, which will slow down the vine's growth. And the upper pitchers may turn brown prematurely. If uh, if you're getting brown pitchers on the new basal shoot, it may be that the plant is not being kept wet enough, or perhaps you should apply a foliar fertilizer, or if it has pitchers on it, feed it something like osmocote pellets or insects. Um, but the pitchers also are the actual leaves, so older pitchers will be turning brown. But I wouldn't worry about it. If it has basal shoots, that's the sign of a healthy plant that's starting to regrow itself. And uh, you may want to cut the older vine back, as we talked about earlier, and let all the energy go into the basal shoots, to, uh, which will then reproduce the entire plant all over again. So we've talked about lots of different genera of of carnivorous plants uh, all around the world. Is there anything, are there any carnivorous plants that haven't really, any genera that have really haven't come into cultivation, but we might see come into cultivation in future or anything interesting that we might be seeing in our nurseries or garden centres anytime soon? Some of the new ones that have been discovered, like, a plant called a genus called Philcoxia, which is found in desert areas of South America. Um, I don't think they're fascinating plants. They have very bizarre traps that actually are under sand and catch little nematodes. And obsessive collectors like myself would love to try and grow those plants. But plants like that won't become popular windowsill plants. Please tell me that Phil Coxy is named after a guy called Phil Cox. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Actually, I want that to be. T- I want that to be the truth. I'm sure it's not, but <laughs> yeah, no, it it may very well be. Um, like uh, Nepenthes Rob Cantleyi was named after a famous British grower who now you know has his nursery in Sri Lanka, 
and his name is Rob Cantley. So they named uh, a Nepenthes uh, that he cultivated, Rob Cantley. I so Philcoxia may be named after him. Okay. Philcox. Well, is there is there a Nepenthes damato de, de or a Saracenia damato around anywhere? I do have I do have an incredible Nepenthes that was named after me um, by somebody who grew a plant, uh, a hybrid that was produced by. Uh, by a German grower named Dr. Marabini. It's Nepenthes Peter D'Amato. It's a hybrid between Loai and Ventricosa. And uh, it's photographed in my book. It's very popular. Um, rooted cuttings on eBay can still go for, um, I don't know the equivalent in, uh, in euros, but you know it's, it's a couple hundred dollars for a rooted cutting. Um, but yes, I was very flattered to have this magnificent plant named after me. But yeah, a lot of people are, you know, they hybridize, they produce some really nice plants, and they may name it, name it after a loved one. Um, with Saracenia, I like to give sinister names, um, like uh, Abandoned Hope, which was on the cover of my first book, um, Lamentations. I named one Saracenia Extreme Unction, which is the death rites of the Catholic Church. Uh, you could have a lot of fun with these plants, so uh, giving them... Oh, I've you know. got to have a Saracenia Extreme Unction. That sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah. I'm a sucker for a good name, so that's, that's totally sold, sold on me. Thanks. Well, when it comes to the future, <laughs> the question that you started uh, you know, this section on, um, I think it is with hybrids. Um, Saracenia hybrids, Nepenthe hybrids, Mexican butterwort hybrids, and there's so many mutated Venus flytraps and flytraps, which is only one species, but there's uh, people are crossing them and getting bigger and bigger traps or very strange looking traps. At our nursery, we have over a hundred different Venus flytrap cultivars alone that are on display. And not all of these mutated fly traps actually work. Uh, some of them, the traps can't close. Um, so you have to, you know, apply a foliar fertilizer to really keep them healthy. Do you have a problem with that? I kind of wonder whether some growers feel like that's a step too far when you've, when you've read it when, it, when it's got to the point where the trap cannot function to do what the trap would do naturally is that taking the hybridization too far or do you just kind of think it looks really cool it doesn't really matter you can still feed it that's fine i have seen some fly traps mutated ones on like facebook and i tell people kill it before it multiplies um <laughs> because i just feel sorry for the poor thing you know um but some of them are bizarre enough you know if people want to grow these weird things you know, that's that's fine. Um, but in the wild, you know, most of them certainly would not survive for many generations. Well, no, if they couldn't catch, a, <laughs> catch any food. Yeah, that's really interesting. I guess it's just people's people's fashions. It go, goes through fashions. I mean, I, I really love some of the really dark red um, ones with the really dark red inside of, of the traps. I think they're, they're the ones that I'm interested in from the point of view of... Um, interesting venus tra flytrap um, hybrids and there are several flytraps that are entirely purple not just the red traps like royal red or red dragon and i know they're growing them in england too uh, some of those can be very very beautiful when you see an entirely purple venus flytrap yeah i think they're lovely and i guess i think for me venus flytraps will probably always be my most favorite carnivorous plant not least because i killed so many on the way to learning how to look after them as a child i remember buying them quite a few times and kind of even knowing what basically what to do but really not giving them quite the right conditions and not giving them enough light so i kind of feel like it's kind of hard won knowledge now that i can make them thrive so i think they're always going to be my favorite i've i'm just a, i'm not sure what you've how you feel about some growers seem to like leaving the flowers, others remove them. I'm just letting mine flower this year because I just thought, I just want to see what these flowers look like. So I'm, I'm letting them flower, um, which may be a mistake, but we'll see. I don't know what your view is on that. Um, you did that podcast with Tom from Tom's Carnivorous Plants. And uh, 
you know, he recommended that if you have a younger plant, when the flower emerges from the rhizome in the spring, when it's two, three inches tall, it probably is wise to cut it off. It does sap the energy of the plant. If you do let a flytrap flower, it'll probably only have a few small spring traps um, at this time of the year when it flowers, and I would feed them. You know, give them some insects. Let them get the energy from the insects in order to flower and set seed. Uh, the flowers are not very attractive, um, but it is fun to try to grow fly traps from seed. But just be forewarned that will take, you know, four or five years uh, to get a mature plant if you do grow it from so seed. So we'll, with a f- just a few plants, uh, I've probably got about f- four or five plants will i be able to get viable seed from from those if they do set seed usually they have a crown of flowers uh maybe six to eight flowers at the top of the flowering spike and hopefully you'll have two flowers open at roughly the same time or have multiple flowers on a couple of different plants but rub the flowers together the, ant- the flowers are only open for a few days, and the anthers that produce the yellow pollen will mature at a slightly different time than the stigma in the middle, which is where the pollen has to be deposited. The stigma will turn slightly fuzzy, and then it's ready to accept pollen. And it can only do that over maybe a two, three, four-day period. So if you rub the flowers together, you know, from di- you know, different flowers, then you are more likely to deposit the pollen onto the stigma, and then you will get seed from them in several weeks. That sounds great. Well, I'm going to give it a go. I don't think I've got anything to lose. And we've been doing uh, lots of houseplants. So every year I do a houseplant sow along. And this year I have sown some Saracenia purpurea seeds. So they are currently in the fridge uh, as per my instructions from the seed packet. So I'm waiting to see whether I get any success from those. It's, it's such great fun and it's such a cheap way of experimenting that I really enjoy growing stuff from seed. It's, uh, but you do have to be in it for the long game, don't you? Yes, yes. Even with Saracenia, um, it's probably not until like the third year of growth that you actually start to see what the plant is going to look like. Um, but then, you know, they triple in size like every year. So it'll still take about five years to get a mature Saracenia from seed. But they're a lot of fun to grow, a lot of fun. And obviously you've got a heck of a lot of plants at your nursery. Do you have many carnivorous plants in your own home? Or is it kind of like Coles to Newcastle, you kind of keep them in the nursery? I used to, but I've owned my house for 30 years. It's a very small piece of property. Um, I'm surrounded by redwoods, but I'm in a very sunny area. However, I also love palm trees, and I could grow cold, hardy palms here. And my palms have completely (laughs) shaded my yard, so I don't have any sunny enough area to grow them outdoors. But I do have a small terrarium uh, in my bathroom with grow lights on it, and I grow mostly sundews there. And sometimes I experiment. You know, if we get some new variety of sundew or a butterwort, I'll put them in the terrarium and see how they do for six months or a year. But otherwise, it's the lack of direct sun that I'm lacking now. So I don't have very many at my house. So that that actually brings brings us neatly around to one other question from a listener, which was uh, about the best sundew for indoor cultivation. Is it the Cape sundew? It definitely is still the Cape sundew. Um, Even Charles Darwin, who first experimented with the native round-leaf sundew in England, um, he just fell in love with the Cape sundew when he had uh, obtained one from a woman who sent it to him from South Africa. Um, It's very, it's rather large for a sundew. In the spring, we can have Cape sundews that are 16 inches in diameter, Uh, They produce a lot of flowers and seed. The seed will get everywhere on wet peat moss and start germinating, and they literally become a weed. They're wonderful to give as gifts. Uh, They're great for kids. They could uh, do Charles Darwin's experiments of 
feeding different substances to the different leaves and see how the plant reacts. Well, I'm glad to say that my sundews that I, well, I left them outside in, in with my Venus flytraps and I sort of had a panicky discussion with Tom of Tom's carnivores and said, I think I've killed them. And he said, don't panic. They should grow back. And indeed they are. So I'm very happy about that. Eight <laughs> sundews have very thick roots and they could take temperatures uh, quite a bit below freezing for, you know, brief periods. And uh, they definitely do come back. They come back from the roots and from the stem. So they also make a very nice outdoor plant. Yeah, as I say, I've, I've, I'm very happy that mine have, have recovered because I, I was panicking for a bit. But there we go. That's the wondrous, wonderful thing about carnivorous plants is some of them are, are tougher than, than they look. And one final question, Peter. What is next for Peter D'Amato? Have you got any, other than just enjoying your carnivorous plants, is there anything else you're planning to do in the carnivorous plant world other than sit back on your laurels and enjoy being the uh, one of the foremost carnivorous plant people in the world? I have been working on a novel several years. Um, I'm near the end, if I could only figure out exactly how to end of the novel. It's already over 400 pages, and it's, uh, I'm planning on it being around a 500-page book. It's about the Lucifer plant from hell, Lucifera infernalis. It's a, uh, it's a carnivorous plant that looks like a giant sea anemone, and it produces a super vaccine um, if it's fed human body parts. And then you cut the tentacles off and you take the serum uh, from the sap of these tentacles. And uh, you don't get sick. You don't uh, get old. Um, and I have all of these people killing each other, trying to get control of this plant, which was actually introduced by aliens from another dimension. You've got a sale already, Peter. I, I definitely want to buy that book. <laughs> Well, I've had a lot of fun, and a few people who've read it really enjoy it. So, uh, you know, I write on it in my spare time, and I'm hoping maybe within the next year I will finish it up. But, yeah, thanks for asking. Oh, that sounds amazing. Well, I will definitely read that. That sounds like a fantastic uh, plot, and I want to know how it ends already. So that's that's great. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Peter. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, And Jane. an honour to talk to you. And thank you for, for answering my questions and my listeners' questions. I, I think we've all learned so much. So um, we are most grateful to you, Peter. Thank you very, very much. I greatly enjoyed this. <laughs> Well, wasn't that fun? Thanks so much for Peter D'Amato for sparing the time to chat to me from his home in California. And just a side note on potting mixes for carnivorous plants. Even though in the US, peat is the standard, there's more and more research going on in the UK about options for peat-free mixes. And in the show notes for this week's episode, you'll find links to some pages which have recipes for peat-free carnivorous plant mixes from the RHS and others. So do check that out if that's something that interests you. And now it's time for question of the week. It comes from Rebecca, who is in charge of the plants at the cafe that she works in. Whew, that's obviously marks you out as a plant person who has been given the weighty responsibility. So, so far, Rebecca has potted up a Dracaena and a Peace Lily at the cafe, but she's a bit scared of the variegated Schefflera or umbrella plant that she's got to care for too. Why? Well, the soil is incredibly compact and very old. Rebecca says that she's tried aerating, but the water still just flows out of the pot quickly. It's been in the same spot and the same soil for probably at least seven years. So, Rebecca wants to know, any advice for repotting or replacing soil for large plants? It's far too heavy for me to confidently repot, and I don't want to shock the plant. She's very helpfully sent me some pictures of this plant and it's probably about four or five foot tall and looking pretty much how a Schefflera would look if it's been in the same spot for seven years without being repotted so it's a little bit bare in places it's got what we call in the business bare legs um, but it's actually looking very healthy 
all things considered, it is reaching towards the window for some light, not surprisingly. So what do we do with this plant? Well, first off, let's talk about hydrophobic soil. So this is a term that basically describes soil that has got so dry that the water is repelled by the soil particles and just runs off the plant, either through the soil or just pools on the surface. And this happens when your compost becomes very, very dry, uh, when it hasn't been watered for a very long time. In the wild, this can also be caused by other factors like wildfires. But obviously, in the case of a house plant, it's generally just because it's dried out so badly that the soil is bone dry. And it's going to take a bit of an effort to get this plant back to accepting water into the soil. So how do we go about it? Well, ideally, Rebecca, repotting this plant would be the best thing you could do because the compacted soil, the old soil, which is very much depleted of any nutrients, um, but it's a problem. But the main problem is that compaction because the soil has gone um, very much free of air pockets. It's slumped down. Um, and so not much air is getting to those roots, not much water is getting to those roots either. I suspect the plant is badly pot bound. So uh, steal yourself, Rebecca. Get a friend to help after hours at the cafe. Probably best not to do it while you're serving people the, uh, I don't know, bacon butties or the or the tofu uh, stir fries or whatever it is the cafe serves up. After hours, though, get busy and get a tarpaulin down and you get a friend to help you manoeuvre the pot and get these root ball out of the pot and see what's going on. It doesn't necessarily have to go into a bigger pot. Uh, you could just trim away all the excess root material um, and then shake off as much soil as possible and replace it with fresh houseplant potting mix. So that is the ideal scenario. That way you get air to the roots, you replace that hydrophobic foot soil uh, and that soil that's probably got no nutrients left in it for something that is much better for the plant. I appreciate though that that may not be possible. So what's the other options? Well, you can do a thing called top dressing where you scrape away as much as possible of that top layer of soil without damaging any roots. If you can get, say, five centimetres, a couple of inches off the top, uh, that would be ideal. Then get a chopstick and start a bit of a poking. Poke away into the soil as deep as you can. Uh, a kebab stick would also work. And that way you are producing lots of holes in the soil, which will allow water to start to percolate through. If you can lift up the pot and cut off any roots that are coming out the bottom, which may be happening, uh, that would also help. Um, and once you've done that, you can then put fresh houseplant potting mix uh, on the top to replace the stuff that you've removed. And then I would put the pot into a tray of water for a few hours, maybe overnight, because that's the way that the plant will have long enough to soak up water and get rid of that hydrophobic state that it's going through. The holes that you've made will also help the water to percolate. So have it sitting there for a few hours until you can feel that the soil is nice and moist throughout. Uh, and that way you could possibly avoid repotting the plant. As I say, best practice, repot it. It may go back into the same pot and by trimming those roots. But ideally, if you can um, get that plant into a new set of compost. Bear in mind, if you do trim the roots, you need to think about also trimming some of that top growth because you need balance between top growth and root growth. So and, and the, the general mass of, of top growth and root growth needs to be in balance. So if you've trimmed a lot of roots off, I would also trim some of that foliage at the top, taking away the leggiest um, and most, well, wayward branches if you can, so that you're left with a nice shape. Every time you snip something, step back and take a look so that you can check that you're making not making the plant look too unbalanced as you go. So Rebecca, I hope that will help. When you finish that process, then if you put it into new potting mix then it won't need feeding but if you've kept it in the existing potting mix I would also feed the plant and in this kind of setup you may want to go for a slow release fertilizer that will just uh, be in the pot and will re gradually release nutrients to the plant one of those slow release fertilizer sticks so that you don't have to worry about doing anything in terms of feeding very often um, or you could just get a product that you could add to the water every time you water under the old advice weekly 
Daily Weekly. Have you heard that before? I don't know if I've mentioned that, where, yes, you're feeding the plant weekly, every week, but weekly, as in dilute. Um, so it's up to you, but do bear in mind that the plant will need feeding and it will put on a spurt of growth once it's been treated in this way. So that's something that you need to bear in mind. Uh, the plant will hopefully be have, putting on a nice flush of growth. So that's the Scheffler hopefully sorted. Good luck, Rebecca. I hope that your bosses at the cafe and your customers are all happy with your work. If you've got a question for On The Ledge podcast, I'd love to hear from you. Drop me a line on the ledge podcast at gmail.com. Well, that's all for this week's show. I'll be back next Friday when I'll be bringing you some dispatches from the Chelsea Flower Show. Yes, the world's most horticultural event has let me in again to report on what's going on in the world of houseplants and horticulture. So if there's anything you particularly want me to look at, do tweet me or drop me a line and let me know so I can investigate whether it's cacti, carnivorous plants, aspidistras or something else. Let me know what you want to hear from the Chelsea Flower Show and I'll be back next Friday to bring you all the lowdown. But for now... Bye. The music you heard in this week's episode was Roll Jordan Roll by the Joy Drops, an instrument the boy called Happy Day Gakana by Samuel Corwin, and Overthrown by Josh Woodward. The ad music was by the Heftone Banjo Orchestra. The tracks were Whistling Rufus and Dill Pickles. All the music in the show is licensed under Creative Commons. See janeperone.com for details.